Thanks very much. Uh, thank you all for coming. And uh, I'd like to especially thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's been a very pleasurable week here. And the conference itself has also been very exciting. So um, yeah, I'm not going to tell you much about the background and framework for this whole business. That will come up in bits and pieces during the talk. So I hope uh, the basic ideas will nonetheless be uh, understandable. Let me start out then with a um, very concrete theorem of uh, Suslin and Voyevodsky. Yeah, maybe I should say what the goal here is. It's to understand the, um, the relations of the classical stable homotopy category with the motivic stable homotopy category for k uh, an algebraically closed field of characteristic zero. So that's the basic setting. I want to understand how closely these two categories are related. And uh, the, the longer term goal, which uh, has, is yet to be realized, is to understand how the algebraic geometry, which is apparent in this motivic version of stable homotopy theory, can hopefully say something about classical homotopy theory. So that's, that's where we're going. So let me then mention this theorem of Suslin and Voyevodsky. So the paper appeared in 96, of course. It was before then. Um, so let x be a finite type. scheme over a field k, which is algebraically closed and contained in the complex numbers, then, so essentially the Betty realization gives an isomorphism between the mod n Suslin homology and the mod n singular homology of the C-points. It's for all and an N. OK, and here, so let me explain some of the notation, of course. You all know what singular hom homology is. And the Suslin homology is similarly given as the homology of a certain chain complex. And I'll use homological indexing here. So this is given as the nth homology of the Suslin complex, or maybe just for an arbitrary abelian group A, which is as you usually do in Topology, you just tensor this chain complex with A. And how do you define this chain complex? Well, I mean, essentially, this is just maps of x cross an algebraic n simplex into, uh, rather, of an algebraic n simplex into some infinite symmetric product of x. But uh, maybe more precisely, it's just you have this chief finite cycles over x evaluated on delta n, this thing is just you know, sitting inside of affine n plus 1 space given by the sum of the variables equals 1. And maybe usually it's said this way as a group of cycles. It's the free abelian group on the irreducible subvarieties of x cross delta n such that uh, yeah, w is irreducible. And the map from W to delta N is finite and surjective. OK, so that's that guy. And then, uh, yeah. It's not quite so clear from this description to see how you get an obvious map to singular homology. There are a number of ways to do that. You could suitably subdivide delta N and then lift uh, that subdivision to give a 
chain on, uh, on x for every such w. Or you could, again, think of this as a map of delta n into some symmetric power of x, and then use the uh, doled con description of the homology of x given by the symmetric powers. OK, but in any case, um, so of course, you have the usual singular homology is given by a chain complex. It's just the homology of the singular chain complex of x. And so um, in some sense, uh, this guy is taking place in the derived category of abelian groups. And this guy here is taking place in uh, Boyevodsky's category of motives. So we can view this in a somewhat different way, that um, this Suslin homology, in fact, this is one of the guiding principles that led to the construction of these categories, was to interpret this as the maps in the Boyevodsky's triangulated category. I'll write it as actually effective motives of an object, so a sheaf Z with transfers into, so an object A transfers of X of N. So this is taking place in this category here, which you should think of as some kind of motivic analog, or maybe the effective part is not so clear what that has to do with anything, but motivic analog of the derived category of abelian groups. OK, so, so just as so we can view the stable homotopy category in some sense is actually contains the derived category of abelian groups. Let's just view this as a homotopical refinement or of this derived category of abelian groups. Uh, let me say it this way. You can think of this guy as the place. This is where generalized cohomology theories In other words, the objects in this category represent cohomology, generalized cohomology of topological spaces or of reasonable spaces, whereas this is where the ordinary cohomology lives. So for example, singular cohomology with coefficients in an abelian group, you think of as an object in here, just the abelian group. And here you have so things like singular cohomology with coefficients an abelian group, and here you have things like topological K-theory, complex cobordism, various other somewhat more complicated theories, lots of, so lots of cohomology theories here, which are not expressible in terms of chain complexes of abelian groups. OK. And there's a similar analog that um, Boyevodsky's category of motives, again, has a homotopical refinement. This is where things like motivic cohomology lives, or also a tal cohomology, sort of ordinary theories, has a homotopical refinement. Um, the motivic stable homotopy category over our field K, and in fact, um, this contains some subcategory, the effective subcategory. This thing would be, in some sense, the triangulated category generated by motives of smooth algebraic varieties over K. Um, right, and all, if you like, positive Tate twists, but that would be already in here. To get to here, you have to invert the Tate twist. And similarly, there's a full subcategory inside here, the effective subcategory. And the analog of the motive of a variety 
is its infinite suspension spectrum. This is in here, and it's essentially generated by these guys. The analog of the negative Tate twist here, so this, uh, say, tensor product with z of 1 here, or maybe z of 1 of 2, corresponds here with suspension by P1. And so here you get negative suspensions of P, negative P1 suspensions of these things, just as here you allow negative Tate twists of motives of x. OK, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the objects in here are, first of all, constructed by, you take spaces. The analog of spaces would be presheaves of spaces. And then if you have a space, you can, uh, every algebraic variety is also a space, just by taking the representable presheaf given by the algebraic variety. So uh, if you point things, then you have a smash product of spaces. And here, uh, you have... P1, this is represented by P1 spectra, which means a sequence of spaces together with maps from P1 smash the nth space to the next space. And then you can define this guy either by shifting the sequence in the right direction, which I will certainly get wrong if I attempt to tell you, or by smashing the individual spaces with P1. Yeah, thank, thanks for letting me tell you about that. Okay. So with this... Uh, very quick preliminaries, let me mention the first theorem that I want to tell you about. So take an object in this effective category and assume that it's a torsion object. So there's a notion of localizing this category with rational coefficients, and this would be something that goes to zero under the rational localization. Okay. And we take k, again, equal to k bar, contained in C. Then the Betty, there's a Betty realization functor from this category to this one. Okay, so I'm going to introduce some funny notation here, which I'll explain. <coughs> okay, so let me explain the notation here a little bit. This is for all. So what's going on here? So first of all, in so here's the explanation. For an object E in this guy here, we have, um, well, bi-graded homotopy sheaves. These are sheaves of abelian groups on smooth varieties over K. So um, just as in here, we have, this is the analog of the stable homotopy groups of an object in uh, spectra. And what are, how are these defined? Well, in spaces, we have spheres. And in motivic spaces, we have spheres with a Tate twist. So we have SAB, that's the topological sphere. A is the topological degree. So this would be something which, under um, Betty realization, would just give you an A-sphere. And B is sort of the Tate twist, if you like. It's the weight Tate twist. So to give some examples, P1, as a space, is a sphere of topological degree 2 and of weight 1. Uh, GM is a topological sphere of weight 1 and dimension 1. And of course, you have S1 is just 
S1. It's weight 0. One other example, you take, say, the affine n space minus the origin. You think of this, the complex points. It's a real 2n minus the origin, so it's topologically a 2n minus 1 sphere. And uh, the weight, I hope, should be n. So that's an example. So we have for actually, um, so we have a suspension operator associated to each of these spheres. And although for spaces they only exist for certain a and b, you've inverted all the possible suspension operators in passing to sh of k. So you can define an a b suspension for every object. And then these you can associate, you get a presheaf by taking u. So this is something in Sn over k. And you can take just the maps in SH of k of, you take the AB suspension of, you have an infinite P1 suspension object, U into E. You take this thing, and then pi AB of E is the associated sheaf. This is a pre-sheaf on. Um, smooth varieties over k, and this gadget is the associated sheaf. So uh, uh, if you like, if we have this view here, this shift by n is an n suspension. So um, yeah, I think I did something wrong here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, nobody corrected me. Should have put the, I'm sorry. It's much better. OK, thank you. So the shift n is the n suspension. And that gives you the homology. And here, this n is giving you the homotopy. So it's, in some sense, the, it's, this isomorphism here can be viewed as a generalization of saying, the homology in the category of motives maps isomorphically to the topological homology, as here the homotopy in the category of motivic uh, stable homotopy category maps isomorphically to the homotopy in the classical world. OK. So let me mention now some consequences of this theorem. Consequences. So maybe there's a corollary. Um, so in particular, we can take E to be the infinite suspension spectrum of some smooth variety X modulo n. So what does this mean? Well, we're in this category. SH of k is just as SH is a triangulated category. So it's an additive category also. And we can just take, if you like, the cofiber of multiplication by n on this gadget. OK. And then what that says, this taking the homotopy sheaves of such an object are just called the mod n homotopy of this object. So just with that notation, so for x smooth variety over k, k algebraically closed, contained in c as above, then the Betty realization <coughs> gives an isomorphism of the um, global sections of this mod n homotopy sheaf to the mod n stable homotopy group of the usual infinite suspension spectrum of oh, 
running out of room here. Okay. Okay, so this would be the direct analog of the Suslin Voyevodsky theorem. Okay. And we can now take in some sense, the simplest possible infinite suspension spectrum, namely the sphere spectrum, which we get just by taking spec K with an added base point and taking its infinite suspension spectrum. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, this is a spectrum. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can just take, uh, you can take an associated from a P1 spectrum. You can get a pre-sheaf of spectra by taking sort of the infinite P1 loop spectrum. That gives you a pre-sheaf of spectra on spec K. And then when you evaluate that pre-sheaf on the base field K, take its global sections, gives you a spectrum, and exactly this um, pi n0 would just be the pi n of that spectrum. Okay. Exactly right, yes, thank you. Right. Yeah. No. I mean, it's some rigidity theorem. It's, um, you have to prove it. It's probably not so difficult to prove. Um, it's a uh, typical of a rigidity theorem, right? We know this in motivic cohomology, for example, right? So this would be an analog of that. So yeah, a rigidity theorem would follow from that, but probably the same techniques you use to prove rigidity in uh, for motives would work directly in SHK, I think. But certainly it would follow from this, yeah. Okay. So um, we take. We take x to be just spec k, and that tells us our infinite suspension spectrum. This is known as just the sphere spectrum. This is the, there's a tensor structure or a monoidal structure on SH of k, and this is the unit for the monoidal structure. OK, we just take that to be. In a case is a special case. We see that Betty realization, again, under the same hypotheses, to the classical stable homotopy groups of the sphere spectrum. So this is, of course, an object of, of central interest in stable homotopy theory. Yeah, there is, but it does, you don't need it. So there's, yeah, it's just not a direct core, right? You need some work. You have to do some work. Good point. So this is not a direct corollary. So you need proof corollary two plus, which I'll I'll mention. Yeah, there's something to do there. Good point. That's, that's forced by the mod n. That's automatically torsion. Yeah. So here, as you pointed out, I'm no longer taking mod n uh, homotopy sheaves. So right, you have to prove something is torsion. So we'll get, to, we'll get to that. Don't you worry. OK. So as a, I already mentioned, this is, in some sense, equivalent to this corollary. So let me call it. Theorem 2, I'm, my numbering has gone now completely crazy, but sorry about that. So again, we take k equal to k bar, take the characteristic of k to be 0. And then there's a functor, just as um, sort of mentioned, uh, if you have the category SH of k is built out of pre-sheaves of spaces, so if you have just a usual space, you can take the constant pre-sheaf on that space, 
if you have a spectrum, a spectrum in the topological sense is, again, just a sheaf, just a sequence of spaces together with maps from the suspension of the nth one to the next one. And you can generate out of such a gadget a P1 spectrum. And so with you know, a little bit of work, there's a functor, a constant, if you like, constant sheaf functor. This is fully faithful. Okay, so the the in essence uh, follows from here. Uh, the Homs here are given. Well, maybe I say a word about the proof of this. Why this follows? Okay, so that's. This is, in some sense, the ma first main step in the goal that I mentioned at the beginning, that we can really, in some sense, do classical stable homotopy theory within this category. You might ask, why would you ever want to do that? It's life that only gets worse there. But um, yeah, what I hope to show you is that there's some interesting algebra geometric uh, operations or structures that exist here, which then also exist here, and that existence or those structures are completely inobvious until you embed SH inside of SH of K. Okay, so that's what I, I hope to get to. Okay, so here's some comments to the proofs. Okay, so let's see. How does corollary, three, as I say here, that corollary three, that's this one. I mean, it's not a, I said it follows from corollary two, but let's say how it follows from. The first theorem. Uh, and this is exactly this question of the torsion. So what one does is there's a natural map of the sphere spectrum, just as uh, you can sort of linearize it, and it gives you a map to the most the spectrum representing motivic cohomology. And then we'll see a little bit later that this is actually realized by taking the so-called zeroth slice of the sphere spectrum. And this is just the projection to its so-called zeroth slice. And you take the fiber of this. Let's just call that f1 of k. For now, we can just consider this f1 of k. Uh, f1 of sk is just the fiber of this linearization map. And one can compute with help from, uh, yeah. So let's see. Let's apply realization. Here we get the sphere spectrum. Here we get the classical eilenberg maclean spectrum on the integers, which represents singular cohomology. And then whatever we have here, we have the realization of this guy. That's what we're doing. I'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. But that's why I want to, I'll get there. <laughs> I'm, yeah, the hypothesis. But I have to verify the hypothesis. So, so you're right. Let's verify the hypothesis. I didn't, I didn't make a statement about anything yet. I'm just applying a function. Yeah, statement of theorem 2 has. No, no, no. No, no uh, theorem 2. Oh, OK. No, no, no. That, follows, that, that doesn't require any torsion anymore. Because everything is torsion. That's, that's uh, everything interesting is torsion. Yeah? Can you prove this also in finite categories? Um, probably, I mean, I haven't done that, but I think yeah. ever inverting yeah. P. Yeah. No, uh, that I don't know. I mean, I, have, I think if you invert P, then you always have these techniques to fool around with. And I haven't investigated it. It's probably true, yeah, after inverting P. No, but sorry, I, didn't, I thought you were talking about, didn't mean to jump all over you there. Uh, but no, you're right. You have to. Uh, everything interesting. They, uh, so 
we'll get we'll get to, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. You'll see what happens here. The idea is that the sphere spectrum is a generator in SH, and so once you know that the maps between the endomorphisms of the shifted endomorphism of the sphere spectrum are correct, then it's automatically true for everything. So the and there's a lack of torsion in SH, but it's just here. Everywhere else is torsion. That's the Serre's theorem, right? So that, that's, but that's roughly the idea. There is non-torsion things, but um, you really view this as generated by S. And once you know that the endomorphism, shifted endomorphisms of S go isomorphically to the same things here, then you're done to just, uh, just build up the whole category out of, uh, out of S. So, so that's, that's the idea of the proof. But yeah, I'll get to that in a minute. OK, so let's see. So what do we know about these guys? Um, yeah, first of all, so we know what the, we know on both sides, we know that pi n0 of hz of, say, k is just the motivic cohomology this thing. And so we know what this is. This is 0 for n not equal to 0, and it's z for n equal to 0. This is just because this gadget represents our h minus n. Get my minuses here. Doesn't matter. And so we know this is just because this guy represents motivic cohomology. OK. And we also know that uh, we have this theorem of Morel, which tells us that the pi 0, 0 of the sphere spectrum on k is the groten dieck witt group of k. But this is also z because k is algebraically closed. So there are no interesting quadratic forms over an algebraically closed field. So if you put this together, it says that pi n n of f1, what this will tell you this is equal to pi n0 of sk for all n bigger than or equal to 1. And we also know by a theorem of Morel that this thing is also 0 for n less than 0. This is also a theorem of Morel. And this is also, I mean, this is for all n not, e let's say, for all n not equal to 0, in fact. So, um, so now, instead of showing that you have an isomorphism between the pi n here, it's enough to show it here. And now this guy is a tor will be a torsion object. So that's, that's the thing. So here's the fact, which hopefully I'll get to. Assuming that the atoll cohomological dimension of the field at 2 is finite, then this f1, sk, is a torsion object. Okay, so I'll get to this later, but this, that's, that's the essential uh, input that you need. That the non-torsion part comes from stuff you can easily understand, and then the torsion part, well, then you use the theorem. So you can apply, so that I can apply theorem 1 to the map pi n0 f1 sk of k pi n, 0 pi n of the Betty realization. And so you get this isomorphism, and the rest, rest is okay. OK. And then, as I said, because S is a generator for this category, once you know, well, that says the Betty realization. Of course, uh, that wasn't about the constant sheaf functor. But let's assume there's some limit argument which says you can always reduce to the case where the field K is con actually contained in C, and then you can split this guy here by the Betty realization. This will be the identity. And so once you know the Betty realization gives you an isomorphism, so does the constant sheet functor. So it works for the sphere spectrum, and then since the sphere spectrum generates everything, it works for everything. So that's, that's the argument. Yes. OK, so 
That's roughly how the argument goes. So, um, let's move on a little bit. Um, what about this second theorem, which, where'd it go? Theorem two. No, theorem two we did, okay. What else have we got? So now I want to explain, yeah. So this theorem one, the idea here is just to reduce to the suslin voyevodsky theorem. The suslin voyevodsky theorem was just a statement about the mod n homology of an algebraic variety. So the first thing to note is by, again, a limiting process, the, you can pass from mod n homology of an algebraic variety to the homology of any torsion object in the effective uh, spectra. So uh, you can you really have a statement about the Betty realization on DM effective uh, for all torsion objects. Gives you an isomorphism between the homology viewed in uh, DM effective and the homology just viewed as a um, yeah a singular homology of the realization. So you want to pass from homology to homotopy, and you do that using the slice tower. So the uh, main ingredient in the proof of theorem 1 is you use the suslin voyevodsky theorem plus uh, Voyevodsky slice tower. So let me explain a little bit about how uh, the slice tower comes in. So um, in the category SH, we have the Postnikov tower. So you take a spectrum and you can look at its n minus 1 connected cover just increase the connectivity. So, and what's this map? This is the n minus 1 connected cover. So that means that uh, it's, it's just a homotopical version of the canonical truncation of a complex. In other words, that uh, Induces an isomorphism on the stable homotopy groups pi m for m bigger than or equal to n and pi m of this truncation is zero for m less than n. So it's, at least with homological notation, it's exactly the canonical, it's the analog of the canonical truncation of a complex. So Voyevodsky suggested you doing something different. Actually, there, this, this is, in other words, associated to a T structure on SH. And in fact, Morel showed us how there's a T structure on SH of K by a very similar story, except, um, of course, we have two gratings. And you essentially just uh, put the two gratings together. And I'll get to that a little later. So there's a, there's a T structure version extension of this. But Voyevodsky suggested something where Instead of filtering by uh, S1 connectivity, if you like, you filter by P1 connectivity. So that's the idea, the slice tower. Um, if you like, this guy is universal for maps of things which are n minus 1 connected to E. So Voyevodsky suggested doing the following. The things which would be n minus 1 P1 connected would be you take this triangulated subcategory inside of SH. And this thing is just the category generated by so infinite direct sums of things of the form uh, an nth P1 suspension of an infinite suspension spectrum of some smooth variety. And this inclusion 
has a right adjoint, and you can then define Fn to be just the composition of these adjoint functors, and that has then a natural co-unit map to the identity. And because increasing m just makes a, for a smaller subcategory, it means you get a tower analogous to the classical Posnikov tower. So this gives the Voivodsky slice tower. So for some P1 spectrum E, you have these gadgets here. Okay, and this is this map here is universal for maps of things which are in this subcategory mapping to E. Now uh, let's see. In our Posnikov tower, you can take the cofiber of this map, and what do you get? Well, all the homotopy groups here are the same as the homotopy groups here, except in degree n. So all you're left with is a spectrum that has one non-vanishing homotopy group, being the same as the nth homotopy group of E, and that's more or less, uh, by construction, the so-called eilenberg maclean spectrum on pi n of e. So this is the guy which represents singular cohomology with coefficients in pi n of e. And then, since it's in degree n, you have to put a suspension in there. So this is something which comes from the derived category of abelian groups. So the Posnikov tower is a way of breaking up an arbitrary, so complicated cohomology theory into pieces which are ordinary cohomology. And the same thing happens here when you take the cofiber here, let's call that Sn of E, this turns out to be just a eilenberg maclean spectrum on, you have to suspend it, this time P1 suspension, on some object, which I call the homotopy, this is a mu for a motivic, homotopy motive of E. So this pi mu n of e is some canonically defined object. It's actually an effective motive. It has additional properties, which I won't go into. But So this is a way of breaking up a P1 spectrum into pieces, which are motives. Now, there's a fly in the ointment. Um, this is really an effective way of breaking up every spectrum. In other words, this tower converges. As you go off to the left here, these connected covers become smaller and smaller. This, this recovers, in principle, all information about E. That's not the case here. It, for a general E, there, there could be something in the intersection of all these pieces, in the homotopy inverse limit of all these pieces. So there's a convergence problem here. So you don't get full information about an arbitrary spectrum E from knowing all the layers in this tower. That's, that's the fly in the ointment. OK. So the fact this, I should just mention, this is the fact that this thing is a motive is due to a, a combination of theorems of Voyevodsky, Pelaez, and uh, Rundig's Osvar. Wasn't, it's not a very easy theorem, but nonetheless, it's there. OK. So, but once you have this, you get an analog of, so once you have a tower, or if you like, a filtration on an object, you get an associated spectral sequence when you want to compute cohomology. In topology, that's the so-called Tia Hertzebruch spectral sequence. So it's also given that, that name in this case. Let me just write that down. So this leads to the atia Hertzebruck spectral sequence, which looks like this. 
for some smooth variety x. If you want to compute the E cohomology of x in weight n, you could try and get it by this tower. And then the, the place where it would start out would be this. And the convergence, I should put in quotes, because again, it doesn't necessarily converge to E. It converges to some quotient of E by this homotopy inverse limit. OK, so let's look at the case. Um, let me mention a theorem, sort of a conjecture of Voyevatsky, which was verified by work of Morel, Hopkins, and Hoywa. So here's mentioned this theorem, conjecture of Voyevatsky. Theorem is due to so Hopkins, Morel, and Hoywa. So Spitzweg had also something to do with it. That, um, okay, so I'll, I'll introduce a new object here from topology. Um, the, you have the so-called Adams-Novikov spectral sequence for, let's say, for the homotopy groups of the spheres. And this has a, starts out, it usually starts in E2, but it also has an E1 complex. Let me write down this E1 complex. This thing is going to be the E1 complex for the Adams Novikov spectral sequence. And I uh, should be able to get to that. This converges to the homotopy, stable homotopy groups of the sphere spectrum. Then, okay, so this is, in fact, uh, it's a bounded complex. You, it's equivalent to a bounded complex. Uh, it's bounded homology in all senses. In other words, it's finite homology, a finite cohomology. So it's a small complex. And so what you can do with this thing is you can then tensor it, make it into a motive by just tensoring z of 0 with this complex. It gives you a motive. This will be in an effective motive, and this is actually equal to the qth homotopy motive of the sphere spectrum. And this is this is for this is for a general k. This is just a, at present the characteristic of k should be zero, and uh, this also works in finite characteristic if you invert the characteristic. Okay, so that's a theorem, and now let me put this together with uh, theorem 2. Theorem 2 says that we can identify SH of K inside, uh, SH inside of SH of K, and we can push it back by the Betty realization. So we can view the thing that this is converging to as actually equal to this guy. That's from uh, theorem 2. And so via that identification, here we have theorem 3. Okay. So after a re-indexing, of spectral sequences, um, the, let's now take k to be k bar inside of C. The Betty realization induces an isomorphism. So we have this, let me call it the, this is the atia Herzebruck spectral sequence when we take E to be the sphere spectrum. And we take X to be spec K. And we take N to be zero for pi star zero of SK of K. And this is the Adams-Novikov spectral sequence. This is for, this is Adams-Novikov for the classical homotopy groups of spheres. And we know that the convergence are isomorphic by the Betty realization. But in fact, the whole spectral sequences are isomorphic. It's not so surprising, at least uh, for the E2 term, 
it follows directly from uh, this theorem of Voyevodsky. Once you know, so it says that the E1 complex here is very close related to the slices of the sphere spectrum. So that says when you look at the E2 terms here, they should be essentially the same as the E2 terms here after Betty realization. You need to make some computation on motivic cohomology, but that's quite easy to do. So in fact, though, that this isomorphism extends to the entire spectral sequence. Okay, so what, what good is that? Well, I don't know. But let me just make a comment about why that might be of some interest. Sort of unclear at this point. Let me just, hopefully I'll say a few more words about that at the end. So, um, who cares? I don't know. But the, what's intriguing for me is that the, the idea is that the slice tower, which is where the Atiyah Hertzebrook spectral sequence comes from, um, can be viewed as a A1 homotopy invariant version. of a Coniveau filtration. So if you like, you have sort of pi n 0 of the sphere spectrum. That's if you like, sort of pi n 0 of on k. It's the same as pi n 0 of the sphere spectrum on delta star over k where this is the co-simplicial scheme of algebraic n-simplices. And here, you can filter this by co-dimension of support. So uh, Coniveau filtration filtering this guy here. So what it says is that if you look at the filtration of the motivic homotopy group here, this is the same thing as pi n of sk. You have a filtration by co-dimension of support coming from taking supports inside of something of co-dimension, so Q, on some n-simplex. And that gives you exactly the filtration on this thing given by the adams novikov spectral sequence. So it says if you view something inside of adams novikov filtration level Q, it means it comes in algebraic geometry from something here supported in co-dimension Q. So what good is that? I don't know. I mean, but possibly it could be exploited. I think it's at least intriguing. OK, so that's one way in which algebraic geometry, in a somehow unexpected way, shows up in stable homotopy theory. So let me, uh, in the few remaining minutes, let me give some ideas for proof of theorem 1. and it, I have some time at the end. I'll say a little bit more about this theorem 3. OK, so I already explained the idea is to take the slice tower, um, apply the suslin voyevodsky theorem to the layers where we know we have an isomorphism, and then conclude that we have an isomorphism on the convergence. Of course, for that, you then have two spectral sequences to deal with. You have the spectral sequence associated to the slice tower for E, let's say the sphere spectrum or some other related spectrum. And then you also have the tower you get by taking the Betty realization of this tower. So you need to show that both of those towers have nice convergence properly, properties. So there are actually two convergence theorems that you need to prove. And let me say a little bit about both of those. And I can see from the time I won't have time for much else than that. So let me just say a little word about that. I think it's interesting because um, to prove so we have two theorems. We need two convergence theorems. And they're, so it a little, sounds a little technical, but I think there's some interesting ingredients. The first one is the slice convergence. 
and that says um, take a we need to assume now that the cohomological dimension of our field is finite. And we have a so-called finite spectrum. This is the triangulated category generated by the suspensions of infinite suspension spectra. Of smooth varieties, not taking infinite direct sums, just uh, there's the trying or a thick subcategory generated by th these things. So it's the analog of finite spectra. Then the tower, the slice tower converges in the following sense. If you take um, a point inside of some smooth uh, variety, and you have this sheaf, and you fix A and B, then you have the sheaf FQ of E. You have its stock at this point, the Nisnevich stock. Then this is equal to 0 for all Q sufficiently large, depending on A, B, E, and Q. Depends on. I'm uh, sorry, A, B, E, and X. So actually, the Q that you need goes up as the dimension of X goes up. And since I only have three minutes, No, no, actually, yeah, so it's an interesting point. Uh, the fact that the gadget is torsion comes from the finite two torsion. The fact that this thing converges, you need all the primes. Yeah, it's not just two torsion. And I hope, uh, at least to show why, it actually requires some deep, it requires the Bloccato conjecture, or at least some consequence of it, which I think is fairly close to the whole theorem. So there are two ingredients that go in to this. So the first one just uses the fact that the two cohomological dimension is finite. And that's a theorem of, it follows from results of Morel plus a theorem of Szynski de Gliese, which tells us the following, that under these circumstances, if you take this category and look at it with rational coefficients, this is equivalent to a category of motives with rational coefficients. And then here, we know that cohomology, motivic cohomology, is equal to 0 in negative weights. So OK, with Q coefficients, is also equal to 0. And this gives you enough vanishing to tell you that um, this is this implies this fact that I mentioned that something is tor that these f1 was torsion um, okay and it tells you in particular roughly speaking that the problem is about torsion the convergence problem involves essentially torsion so you'll see that in a minute. The second ingredient is actually the following. To show this vanishes, we prove a weaker statement. We show instead that if you take pi a b of f q of e at some field, where now this is a finitely generated extension of k. So let me, I guess I'll just have time to and go into pi a b e of f. Then this is the zero map for Q sufficiently large. And it, turns, uh, and it turns out that this is enough to show the vanishing in general by some tricks. And this uses our explicit model for FQ of E. 
and reduces to sort of the interesting part of this model. It's given, as I said, by things on delta with co-dimension, certain co-dimension support. And so if you're looking at FQ, the most natural thing to look at is to look at delta Q. And then you take some point x, and let's say in delta Q of F, not in the boundary. So this x is going to look like x0 up to xq, the sum of the xi's being 1. And it turns out that uh, the F, this fq of e pi a b of fq of e of f is sort of built out, at least partially, out of things you take e, the spectrum of e with supports at x uh, evaluated yeah, at k of x, or evaluate, sorry, evaluated at f. And this thing uh, turns out to just be uh, using, let's say, pi a b in this thing, uh, using sort of purity. Yeah, maybe there's a. Since we're on a uh, q simplex, this is an a minus q b here because this contributes, this adds uh, topological dimension q to it. And this is the same thing as e on delta q modulo delta q minus x. And by, uh, so purity isomorphism, this, is, this adds a 2q q. This is a, this is a 2q q sphere. So this becomes an a plus q, b plus q of E on K of X. So for large enough Q, this is because of the weight argument, this is then a torsion gadget. That's where that comes in. And you can factor the map as follows. It comes just, so you have this map, pi A plus Q, B plus Q of E on K X. That's, the, that's something coming from FQ, goes to pi A, B of E on F, is gotten as follows. It's just gotten by a cup product uh, from, with respect to this class X. Uh, we finished in just a second, sorry. In the milner witt KQ of, of F. And the point is that this thing, this thing being torsion, means that this factors through this modulo some n. And this thing vanishes for q sufficiently large by block cotta. OK, so that's, thanks. Sorry I went over time. And thanks for your attention.